Deacons, if you could come on down, we're going to have our time of offering. Uh, God, we thank you for uh, just everyone that's here today. And God, we thank you for a country where we can come and worship freely, God. And as we take this offering, we ask that you would uh, just guide this time, bless the, the offerings, bless our generosity, Father, as we continue to be the hands and feet of you. And we just thank you for this time as a church family. It's in your name we pray. Amen. While they are doing that, I totally forgot my bulletin, so I was going to point some stuff out, but that's okay. But in just a minute, there should be a QR code. If you're a first-time guest, I'm good, thank you. If you're a, a first-time guest or a long-time uh, member, attender, if you could scan that and uh, get us a record of your attendance, we will not spam your email. That is more so just to give you information as to kind of what's going on in the life of the church, get you information that you might need. Uh, while these guys are taking off, I want to point out a couple of things. If you walked by out here at the table, there's... Uh, Christmas in July, we partner with a ministry called Allies in Youth Development, and there's a whole shopping list, but if that freaks you out a little bit, there's also a QR code you can scan, and you can just make a cash donation if that's easier, um, and you don't have to go do all the shopping, and so if you could take a peek at that table on your way out, and then secondly, uh, tomorrow... We will be under the sea, if you can see all of this. And so we're going to have about 105 pre-K through sixth graders here for VBS. So if you're not going to be here, if you could find a few minutes tomorrow and Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday just to say a quick prayer for us adults that will have to manage all of that, but also, uh, more importantly, for the kids, uh, there will be a time where they are distraction-free and can learn about a loving God who cares a lot about them. But other than that, we just want to say welcome and so glad you're here. Let's stand back up and continue to worship. I'm going to 
going to read from uh, Psalm 57. It says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So let's exalt the Lord this morning with our praise, with our singing, and with our music. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love. Chose a criminal's end, paid with blood 
Last night, I, I got to go on a date night with my wife. Um, in fact, it was her idea, and we, we went to, you know, pretty popular place to go on a date night, uh, H-E-B, the new H-E-B <laughs> in Mansfield. And you laugh, but it actually was one of our most uh, meaningful date nights. I mean, it really, it really brought us together, but I need to give some advice. If you haven't gone there yet... Um, I just want to prepare you, get your head in the game, okay? If, you, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Don't go in there and, and, and just kind of like be laid back. You got to be ready to play the game. In fact, you need to take off your Walnut Ridge t-shirt, you know, love God, love others, make disciples. Take that off, get some sharp elbows. If you want the milk, you got to go in there and get that milk, because they're not letting you do that, right? I mean, you got to be ready to, to, to be a little bit uh, tough if you want to get in there. Uh, but uh, no, it was, it was actually a, a fun experience to go. I did purchase the uh, Creamy Creations cookie dough ice cream to, to test it out. And uh, I never thought the day would come that I would say this. Maybe I'm becoming an adult. But it had too much cookie dough in it and not enough ice cream. It was like eating a, a you know, bowl full of cookie dough with a little ice cream added. So that's just my critique. I'm sure that HEB is listening to this and, and will change accordingly. Uh, but the, the reality is sometimes in life, uh, we, we may not say it so directly but we kind of want to take off the t-shirt and, 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 and live our own way. It's like, we, I don't want to put the Walnut Ridge logo on the back of my car window because people will turn away from the faith. People will not come to church when they see how I drive. But the, the, the sermon series that we're finishing today uh, called Good Book is about taking the Bible understanding on our own how to read the Bible 
and, and how to uh, take it and, and bring it into our lives in a meaningful way that connects us closer to God, but also that helps us to know how to apply it into our lives. Um, so we are finishing today talking with that idea of applying the Bible in our lives. And the image we have is the, the, the prospector. You know, the old prospector that goes in the, in the hills to find the, the gold, looking for uh, what's best, what's most valuable. That's another way that we approach the Bible. Now, if you've not been here for the previous four messages, or even if you've been here for all of them, uh, if you remember any one thing, I think the most practical, helpful thing for us is this. Uh, invest $30, $40, $50 in a study Bible. A study Bible that's not based on a Christian personality. Uh, the Charles Stanley study Bible may be great, but I would not make that your primary study Bible because it's based on the opinions and the interpretations of one individual. But you find a translation you can understand, maybe the NIV or the NLT, New Living Translation, which is what I typically preach from. And oftentimes that translation, the committee that translated it, the group of scholars that translated that translation, uh, translation, they'll have a study Bible. And so you'll find, for example, an NIV study Bible or NLT study Bible. That means the notes in there, it, it's been thought uh, and, and discussed among a group of experts, not just one pastor or, or one seminary professor. But what you'll find with a study Bible is instead of knowing John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, instead of just knowing the one Bible verse, you can read through the Gospel of John. And you can start out at the beginning of the Gospel of John. There are going to be two or three pages that show you and tell you who wrote the book, uh, why he wrote the book, when he wrote the book, and what the, the history is, what the culture is uh, that, that is surrounding that. Because remember, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And so we can't read the Bible as if the words are written to us, because if you do that, there are going to be times that you scratch your head and say, God, what does um, wearing clothing with two different types of fabric, what does that rule have to do with me? Well, if, if you look in the, the beginning of the book of Leviticus, you'll understand that it was written specifically for civil laws, for people in a time very different from us. And so having a study Bible will help you know what each book of the Bible is about. And then if you read a verse and you think, I'm so confused, I don't know what this verse is about, in a study Bible, the first half of each page will typically be the scripture, and then the bottom half will be notes to explain that scripture. And so I would tell you this, most important thing you can take away uh, is if you don't have a good basic study Bible, go buy one. You can go to Half Price Books, you can go on eBay or Amazon and find one that's used, or if you can't afford it, come to me and the church will purchase you a, a study Bible. Uh, we, we feel it's that important. So if you're the kind of person who comes to church and you just want one practical thing, you may feel like, okay, I'm going to go buy a study Bible. Now I get to check out the rest of the sermon. Okay, That's fine. That's fine. I, I accept that. I know that. But get, get a good study Bible. Now, we are going to go into the book of James today in a, a passage that is familiar to many of you. Uh, the book of James, verse uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 22, uh, says something pretty important to us as we close up this study. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. Uh, the first point you'll see if you've got a bulletin and you want to jot this down is simply that Scripture is meant to transform, not just to inform. Scripture is meant to transform, not just to inform. Uh, you, you notice that the, the author says, James says to, to the first uh, folks who would have read this 2,000 years ago, he says, don't just listen to the Word or to the Bible. And you catch that difference? And we would say, don't just read the Bible. But they didn't read the Bible for the most part. It would be read aloud to them when they would go to a synagogue on Saturday. 
was they didn't have a printing press. Everyone didn't have a copy of the Bible unless they were incredibly wealthy. And so James says, don't just listen. And to us, it would be don't just read the Bible, but, but do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. See, if, if we think that the idea here is to win at Bible trivia, you know, I want to be the smartest so I can answer every question that's asked of me. Uh, when, when I'm standing around before the service or after the service and, and someone comes up to me and asks me about a, a Bible verse or a concept of the Bible, usually I can tell them something about it, but oftentimes I include in my answer I, I, I don't know all of that, or I don't even, I don't know that, but I can look it up for you. No one should be expected, uh, or, or no one should be, uh, think that they're capable of understanding every verse in, in the Bible, right? The goal is not to win at Bible trivia. The goal is not to know everything about every verse in the Bible. That's really uh, too much. The goal is to understand and then to do. James says, don't just look at it, don't just listen to it, but do what it says. Now, one important note in how to interpret the Bible, how to look at what it says and and know what it means. He says, do what it says, but we have to understand when we read the Bible, there are some passages that prescribe, like you get a prescription That is the doctor saying, to get better, I'm telling you, do this. And so you get the pill bottle, and you take the pills three times a day, and you get better because the doctor has prescribed it to you. In some Bible verses, some Bible passages prescribe things to us. They tell us, do this, think this, don't do this, don't think that. And so some Bible passages are prescriptive. They prescribe Uh, to us, but other Bible passages are descriptive, especially in Old Testament stories, but they describe something that has happened. It is like an account from history, but oftentimes in the Old Testament, there'll be an account of something that someone did, and what they did is obviously bad and immoral and wrong and goes against what the Scripture says elsewhere. And what happens is we make the mistake, and especially critics of Christianity make the mistake of saying, oh, how can you believe Christianity? Uh, look at this passage here. It says this. And they're, they're reading it as if the Bible is prescribing, as if the Bible is saying, do this. But no, when we read a story in the Bible, we have to be careful. Is this story describing what happened, or is it telling us you should do this? And once you begin to think of it that way, you begin to see Bible passages differently. And passages that maybe before had troubled you and made you scratch your head, you realize, oh, Scripture's just telling me what someone did. It's not telling me to do it. And usually you will be able to see that in the Scripture passage. So it's, James says, do what it says. So we do want to check. That we ask, is this just an example of someone who did something good or bad, or is this prescribing? Is God telling us to do this? Now, we want to be informed. We have Vacation Bible School uh, this coming week, and a part of Vacation Bible School is giving children a, a basic knowledge of the Bible and of Bible truths so that they know just enough to, to have that foundation to be able to know that they can choose to trust in Christ. Informing people is an important part of what we do as a church. But the danger is when we think that being informed is what's most important and what it's all about. Because a Christian who knows a lot of Bible facts and a lot of Bible verses can be a dangerous person to be around. Because oftentimes they are caught up in an arrogance that says, I know more about the Bible than than others. And I know more Bible verses than others. I have more knowledge than others. And we can become proud and we can become so caught up in, in what we know that we forget we're supposed to do. If you give me an option to hang out with two people 
And, and one of them is a Bible expert, and they know all, of the, all the verses, and they know all the passages, but they're kind of judgmental, and they're kind of arrogant, and they've kind of got that Christian air of, I'm better than you, and I'm more churchy than you. If you give me the, the, the opportunity to hang out with that person who doesn't do what the Bible says, and then you got a guy over here who's so rough around the edges, is new to the faith, is new to Christianity, but here's the Bible verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and is so moved by that, that he goes out and he tells someone else after church, you know, out at Walmart, man, God loves you, I just learned God loves you so much, he gave Jesus. So, so here's one guy, barely knows anything, but he knows one Bible verse, and he goes out and he does something about it. I would rather hang out with that guy than the guy who knows all the Bible knowledge. And some of you are shaking your head like, yeah, I've been around that first, that first person. I don't want to be around them. So yes, we want to be informed about the Bible, but we also want to be transformed. Let's be honest. How many of you have heard someone say, or maybe you've said it yourself, yeah, I was at such and such church for so long, but then, you know, the pastor, he just wasn't feeding me. He just wasn't feeding me. And the, the mistake there, the problem there is so often uh, what's being uh, communicated is really, hey, it's the pastor's responsibility to give me something motivational, something new, to, to explain a Hebrew word or a Greek word that I didn't know. The pastor needs to really meet my needs for knowledge every single Sunday or I'm going to have to find another pastor. Now, there may be some pastors out there who absolutely uh, are, are preaching shallow and, and not much from Scripture, and so there, there can be truth to the criticism there. But oftentimes what that says is, I'm not taking the responsibility to read my Bible three minutes a day or longer. I'm not taking my responsibility to study the Bible for maybe 15 minutes at a time or 30 minutes at a time, maybe once a week or every couple of weeks. I'm not taking the responsibility to read and, and study the Bible, and so I'm putting everything on the pastor. And, and the pastor has to, to, to give me 25 minutes, 30 minutes of, of, of Scripture that's going to keep me fed all week. And that's kind of like saying, I'm not going to eat breakfast or lunch for six days I'm going to go six days without breakfast or lunch, and then I'm going to have one giant meal every Sunday morning. It's not going to work, right? It's not going to work. We feed ourselves every single day, and then on Sunday, uh, we, we, we get some more from the Word of God. And so we want to be informed, but we want to be transformed. The second thing we see is this. First, determine the primary truth of a scripture passage, then consider how it works in life. So first determine the primary truth of a scripture passage, then determine how it works in life. James said this in, in verse 23, 24, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it is like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. So th this idea of fooling ourselves if, if we don't look into the word of God, if we don't pay attention to what it is saying and what God is trying to communicate to us, if we walk away and we don't apply that truth, we don't live out that truth, or we don't do something with what the scripture has said, he says, you're fooling yourself. You know, let's be honest, we can go to church every Sunday. And we can walk out of here and we can say, oh, great, great message, Pastor. Oh, you really brought it. You know, we can say positive things about the message, but if we, if we leave and, and there's nothing that we take home with us that we're going to change how we think or, or how, how we live, then I don't know that the pastor has succeeded and I don't know if you have succeeded, right? Now, let, let's, let's just truthful. If you go to church a lot, you hear a lot of messages. If you go to a Sunday school class, you hear Bible studies. You may listen to something on, on YouTube. You may listen to some podcasts. You may get a lot of scripture. And I understand, we're not gonna be able to apply everything that we hear. That's tough to do. But if we find ourselves going week after week after week, hearing Bible studies, hearing sermons, and, and we're never applying it, we're never taking it and, and changing how we think or how we act, 
then, then we've got a, a problem. And so we want to determine a primary truth when we read a Bible passage and then determine um, how does it work in life. You know, one mistake that you'll hear sometimes in a Sunday school class or a small group is someone will read a Bible passage and then they'll ask the question, what does that mean to you? Have you ever heard that? And that's a bad question. Because what the Bible means is what the Bible means. It doesn't matter what you think it means or what I think it means. So one of the things we've said before is when Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, the people in the city of Galatia or the area of Galatia, when Paul wrote that letter, he had an intention in each, each verse, in each section, he intended to, to say this and to communicate this truth. It doesn't matter what you think he, what you think it means. It matters what did Paul mean. And when the first readers heard that, what did they take it to mean? It's kind of like in the Supreme Court, you, you have the originalist. They want to go back to the original text of the, of the Constitution and, and use that to determine how laws should, should work. It's that same idea. We want to go back to what it means when it was written, not what I think it means or you think it means. And so we determine what it, what it means, what did God mean to communicate at that time to those people, and then we, we can bring from that the, the truth from Scripture. We can bring a, a truth out of that by, by what we see, what it means, but then we've got to take the next step and say, how does it work? See, it's easy to get a truth and to feel like, oh, wow, I got new insight today. I got new insight to a, to a Scripture you know, I, I really, boy, that just made me feel really good and, and, and accomplished that I kind of got a, this nugget of wisdom from the scripture I hadn't really seen before. But James says if we get that kind of sensation, that kind of feeling after reading the Bible and then we walk away and we do nothing about it, he says, you fooled yourself. I think I'm so spiritual because I got that wisdom. James says, no, you got to do what it says. And the hard work of, of reading the Bible is, is not understanding just what it means, but once we understand what it means, once we pull out a truth, it's to say, how does that work? How does that work in my life? How can I change how I live because of the scripture that I have read? It, it should move us to action. I had a dream a few, a few weeks ago, and I don't think I've told you this story before. If I have, just pretend I haven't, okay? And laugh when you're supposed to laugh. Uh, but I had a, a, a dream, and it was one of those dreams that was so vivid, and it was so real that, that um, I mean, it just, it, it completely threw me off. I dreamt that I was with my brother and sister. We were going on a road trip, had my dog Snoopy with us, and we stopped at Bucky's or someplace like that, and, and I let Snoopy out in a certain area, and we went in the store, and, and we somehow left from a, a different entrance, and we got in a different car, and we drove on the, the road trip. We kept going. We left my dog there, and uh, after three days, I realized, oh my goodness, I left my dog at Bucky's. And so I'm panicked. And so I, I drive back to that, to that convenience store, whatever it was, and, and Snoopy's not where he is supposed to be. And my, I, the guilt I felt was horrible. I'd forgotten my dog for three days. And so I start wandering around calling his name out. And in my dream, I call his name out three times and it's, it's building. And I'm like, Snoopy! Snoopy! And then the third time it's like, Snoopy! This this loud scream. And all of a sudden I wake up to the sound of a bark. And I'm sitting up in my bed and I've got my arms outstretched. And my dog Snoopy has jumped out of the recliner and he's right in the middle of the bedroom and he's like, Woof! I'm here! I'm here! It's like, I just imagine from his perspective he's sound asleep and all of a sudden I start screaming his name. He's like, well, I'm just right here. What are you doing? But the dream was so realistic. It moved me to action. You know, and in my dream, I thought I was just yelling his name in my dream, but I was actually yelling it out in the, in the house. Uh, scripture should move us to action. It should move us to do something, not just to learn something, not just to know something. And then the final thing we see is uh, scripture application must work for middle class Americans and for impoverished Africans. 
You may think that's a weird point. Scripture application must work for middle-class Americans and for impoverished Africans. See, that's the problem with the health and wealth gospel. That's a problem with the word of faith movement. Not only do their teachings not apply to Jesus, who was poor and who was often homeless, not only do the, their teachings not apply to Jesus, they don't apply to Paul, they don't apply to the disciples, they don't apply to most people in the early church, and they don't apply to Jesus' teaching says, if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. They don't apply to Paul's teaching who says, you know, if, if, if you really are sold out for Jesus, expect trouble, expect the world, it's, things are going to be hard for you. The problem with a teaching like the health and wealth gospel, the name it or claim it, manifest with your words, is they take verses from here and there out of context, and they apply them to middle class Americans, and that's very motivating to us because we're capitalists. We're in a society where we want to work harder so we can make more money. They, 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 they apply them to us. And, and we may say, oh, wow, this is kind of motivating. This makes me want to go sell more real estate. This makes me want to you know, get a start, side job. They apply to us, but those very same verses, there's no way you could apply those verses or take those applications and apply them to someone in poverty in Africa. The Bible was not written just for middle class Americans who are comfortable, Right? The Bible was written uh, so that everyone in the world could glean truth from God's, God's word. And so if I take a Bible passage and I pull out an application that I'm just seeing with my middle class American modern eyes, and that application wouldn't work or wouldn't apply to someone in poverty in Africa, then maybe I should question that application. Now, let me just say, I'm not trying to be legalistic here. And I'm not trying to say that, that we can't ever apply something to our circumstances that doesn't necessarily work for someone in a different culture, but we should be cautious. We should be cautious not to teach things or say things about how we apply the Bible that assume that everyone is like us and is in the same situation. There's a humility that comes when we look at a Bible truth and then we say, how, how do we apply it? And maybe we say something like, for us in America and, and, and where most of us are in life, I think we could take this Bible truth and we could apply it this way. But we're cautious to, to realize that's not necessarily gonna work for everyone. L let me give you an idea of what I'm saying because maybe this is, is, is confusing. So I read the Bible as a modern uh, middle class uh, American. What if I read the Bible with a mindset that I am a young soldier uh, in, in the military fighting for Ukraine? How would I read the Bible differently if I was in that situation? My perspective would, would be different, wouldn't it? How would I read the Bible if I were a teen? A teen in, in America living in inner city Chicago right now. And every weekend hearing the, the gunfire outside. And, and being pressured to be a part of a gang. Being uh, constantly pulled into a life that is going to lead me uh, into a dead end uh, result. How would I read the Bible if I was a teen in in? inner city Chicago? How would I read the Bible if I was a, a single mom burdened by debt with, with three high maintenance needy children and trying to make enough money to, to feed those kids? How would I read the Bible? See, each of those, those, those people that I, that I, I mentioned, they're going to read the Bible with different perspective, aren't they? Their eyes are going to, different things are going to jump out at them. Different things are going are gonna, to uh, uh, make them really look and say, oh, God is speaking to me here. Whereas for us, it would just phew, go over our head. We don't, we don't even see that. That's why I love the fact that, that, that in this area and, and in, in this time, God has made us a, a community where we have a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. We have a, pe a lot of people that we're not all the same. We're not all churchy people. In fact, that's, that's the praise God for that. And, and so we, we can see the Bible from different perspectives. And we, we need that. We need that. And so always ask yourself, am I reading the Bible simply through my perspective of the denomination I grew up in or what my pastor thinks 
or, or what my culture says? Am I reading the Bible according to my political leanings? Am I leading the Bi- reading the Bible according to just what I think I want it to say? And so we have to apply the Bible to our lives in a way that is, that is honest, in a way that looks at it from the perspective of, of, of others. Because the reality is we don't want to read into the Bible. We want to read out of the Bible. When we read into the Bible, we bring our opinions, our perspective, our childhood, our Sunday school teachers of all our lives, our pastors from from before, the TV preacher, we bring all that into it, and then we read the Bible and we're like, oh, this this must mean this, because that's what I've been told. We don't honestly dig in the scriptures. We don't look to the scriptures as authority. We look at, uh, at teachers. We look at, we look at pastors. We look at others. No, we need to read out of the Bible. What did God say through Paul when he wrote this letter 2,000 years ago? What is God saying to me now that I understand that? Now, if you are intimidated at all by this sermon series of five messages, then I, then I failed right? Because my, my goal in this message series is not for you to feel like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know enough. My goal is for you to say, I've got a tool, one or two or three or four, that now I can use when I read the Bible. My goal is for you to understand that you don't need a priest. I'm not a priest. I'm a pastor. Jesus is the priest, So for you to talk to God, you go through Jesus. For God to talk to you, God goes through through Jesus, and you got a Bible that has God's word. So I'm not the authority of what the Bible means. I'm not the one who has the final say of this is what a passage means. You are. And you you, you talk to Jesus about it, right? But, But God has given his word to you as he's given it to me. And so the greatest habit you can take away from this series, and some of you have told me you've done this, read the Bible three minutes a day. Not 10, not 20, not 60. Now you can, but if you set out, okay, I'm gonna read the Bible 30 minutes a day, you're gonna give up after five days when you get busy. But if you make the habit, I'm gonna read the Bible three minutes every day. What you're going to find out, that's an easy habit to incorporate into your life. Two weeks later, you'll find yourself reading for five minutes. You'll find yourself reading for 10 minutes. Read the Bible every day. And then pick up a couple of the tools that you've learned in the series. And use them to understand the Bible passage. Because our goal is not just to be informed, but to let God transform us, to change us from the inside out. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful Uh, that we can look and see in what's an ancient collection of of letters. The Old Testament, the New Testament, we can look in these these books, these letters that were written so long ago, and we can understand truth from Almighty God. Words written by people, but words that you directed and you guided and you blessed, and we've got your truth in our hands. Lord, help us to be a church that is filled with people who don't just show up on Sunday to hear someone talk about the Bible, but walk out of here and get up Monday morning and read the Bible. God, may we understand that we don't have to be scholars. We don't have to have degrees. We don't have to spend an hour a day reading the Bible. We just need a habit every day of saying, I want to hear something that God has for me. Help us to be a church that builds that habit. Lord, we pray that we would be transformed as we read the Bible. That we would look at it not just to inform us, but to transform us, to change us. That we would begin to think when we read the Bible, God, how should this change how I think? And how should this change what I do? Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word and giving us the tools. We're going to sing a song of of worship. This is just a time to reflect, time to respond. If If you need someone to pray for you, 
one of our, our deacons or leaders are going to be standing at the back of each one of these aisles. And if you've got something that you just need a prayer from someone, just go up to them, tell them your name real quick, remind them your name, and just ask, uh, to pay, pray for this, pray for that. If you need to talk to a pastor, I'll be up front uh, during this song uh, and afterwards. But this is our time to reflect and to respond to what God has done as we've studied his word together. Let's sing. Just a couple of quick things. Next week, we start a, a series called The Confident Christian, and it's going to be a five-week series studying the, the Holy Spirit and prayer, and because it is through God that we receive confidence, and it's through prayer that we receive confidence, and so I hope you'll join us next week. Next week, we'll also have lunch. Uh, we'll have a meet and greet, so everyone is invited to stay after the service. Uh, it'll be a VBS celebration. We'll have subs on Sunday, and so we hope you'll join us for that uh, next Sunday. And then uh, go ahead and sign up to go to prison with us. Uh, behind the walls, Bill Glass, the information is, is right in here. I've told you this my first time. I was kind of made to go. Uh, by another pastor, and I didn't really want to go, and uh, this will be my fifth trip, and the rest of them I've wanted to go to, and so sign up to go. There's a women's trip. There is a men's trip, and uh, if you have never been in a prison in your life, uh, you can go. If you've been incarcerated before, typically you can go. Each unit will have some different instructions, uh, so uh, sign up. It is an awesome experience, and you will lose 93% of your timidity and your fearfulness of telling people about Jesus once you have done this. It is an awesome, humbling, 
uh, experience. So I hope that you'll go with us. So sign up for that uh, soon. Uh, and with that, we are going to need a few hands to um, stack some chairs after we're uh, finished here. So after we pray, look for the guys in the back and give you some instructions and you can help out a bit. Let's pray together. God, you are good. Uh, you are moving in our midst, and we acknowledge that. We receive that. And God, we want to be faithful to that. You want us as individuals and as a church to make a difference in this community, in our city. Right now, we pray for VBS, for VBX, that 100 plus kids that are here, that they would know the love of Jesus and the truth of your word when this week is over. Lord, I thank you for the 30, 40 volunteers who are serving uh, this week to love these kids and to teach them about you. May we be faithful, God, to reach out not only to kids at VBS, but to inmates in prisons all around us, Lord. May we be faithful with your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. God bless. Have a great week.